Many games out there are almost absolutely perfect, but are held back by like one significant thing. It's either a technical issue, a story problem, or just a strange game design choice. No game is really truly perfect. There's always something to nitpick. So today we wanted to just do that and highlight that in 10 games. Please note this is highly subjective and are just some choices we found by scouring the internet, found some consensus. Uh, we'd love to hear your picks for a part two of this video because there are definitely plenty of examples. But anyway, we got 10 of those examples today, so uh, let's get started off with number 10. Assassin's Creed Unity, believe it or not, is actually a very good Assassin's Creed game. You probably wouldn't know it just because this game was the subject of so much ridicule when it first launched, and rightly so. This 2014 game released and it was supposed to be the first big next generation Assassin's Creed game. It was the first one fully made completely just for the newer PlayStation 4 and Xbox One generation, and it had a lot of problems when it launched. This game was an absolute mess. It was memed to all hell for being riddled with bugs, all sorts of lag problems, graphical issues, characters T-posing. You've probably seen the image of people's faces missing in the game with just like eyeballs or floating teeth. This thing was a hot mess. The technical problems were so bad that it caused some serious damage to the series reputation for quite some time. But now in 2023 with hindsight and a lot of the technical issues with the game solved, Assassin's Creed Unity is actually really good. It's like one of the last mainline traditional Assassin's Creed games with that old style, but it had some updated combat, uh, some deeper elements to just the world and the way you'd actually go about stealth encounters, but also it had like the best parkour of the series. <laughs> It was way more in depth and you could actually control your character not only climbing up stuff, but carefully climbing down stuff, which was pretty revolutionary at the time. And speaking of revolutionary, the whole French Revolution setting is absolutely incredible. The France they built here is super detailed and filled with characters. When the frame rate isn't collapsing or the game itself collapsing on itself and actually running properly, you can run through the streets push through crowds of people and really see and embrace the detail and get kind of immersed in this world. It's got a pretty decent Assassin's Creed story, it's got a pretty solid Assassin's Creed protagonist and compelling love interest, and there was just a lot to this one, not to mention some pretty good DLC as well. Again, it's not perfect like no game is, and it's also not a perfect Assassin's Creed game, but it was pretty damn great and it was held back by some really bad technical problems. That happens to a lot of games nowadays, but back then it caught us by surprise and it was a bit more painful. Now, next over at number nine, this one's gonna be rough for some people, but let's talk about Batman Arkham Asylum. For many people, this is the definitive Batman game. After years and years of eh, to bad Batman games, Rocksteady seemingly came out of nowhere and completely cracked the code, crafting a near perfect, awesome Batman experience where you felt like a real true Kevin Conroy Batman, using your wits, using your gadgets, and kicking bad guy ass in an incredible, Arkham Asylum setting with a ton of depth, detail, and mysteries to solve. And of course, it's a Batman adventure where like all Batman's greatest villains show up. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, for a lot of people, the one flaw in Arkham Asylum is like that repeated boss enemy mechanic. They did it with Bane. They did it with those big Titan creatures. And then at the end, when the Joker becomes like a big Titan creature, you know, the big monster just kind of runs at you and you dodge out of the way. That shit got pretty old pretty quickly. It was like they figured out everything about a Batman game, but not more complex, large enemy encounters. And if you ask a lot of people online, those parts of the game were pretty lame. The only lame parts, mind you, in an otherwise fantastic game. We'd say that and the fact that the game had a kind of weak ending and final boss encounter. Granted, many games have weak final bosses or weak story endings, but for a Batman game to kind of devolve into the Joker just becoming video game monster, eh, we were hoping for something a little bit cooler. Thankfully, the series totally redeemed itself with that, but still, Arkham Asylum is still one of the best ones and it is near perfect. Next over at number eight, sticking with the superhero theme, we have Marvel's Spider-Man. Yes, Insomniac's great Spider-Man game from 2018 isn't absolutely perfect. It has an incredible story, some great Spider-Man gameplay where they nailed a little bit of stealth, a lot of combat, and web swinging, 
but one place where it really falters is the open world stuff. A lot of the side content is just repeated open world busy work. Granted, for a lot of people, it's easy to forgive it because you're just playing as Spider-Man and playing as Spider-Man is fun and you don't care what you're doing. But some of that stuff really got old after a while. So while in many ways it has now probably raised the bar for Spider-Man games going forward, it is pretty much considered universally to be like the best one in a lot of ways, it failed to really innovate with open world free roaming type stuff. A lot of it was monotonous and just kind of same old type of thing. And considering the game stopped at certain points and made you go out and do the open world busy work, uh, that made it a bit more annoying because you couldn't totally ignore it. Granted, especially as big fans of the game here, this is a very, very small criticism, but it is still worth noting. Spider-Man is almost perfect. Next over at number seven, if we're talking about games that were like almost perfect, almost a masterpiece, whatever you wanna call it, we have to mention Mass Effect 3. Mass Effect 3 really kind of continues the trend of how Mass Effect 1 leveled up to Mass Effect 2. Mass Effect 2 leveled up to Mass Effect 3 with just more great story and character moments, uh, some moments that are really tug at your heartstrings with essentially it being the final battle, almost the end of the universe. Not to mention the fact that by this point they had gotten the combat in a really good place. Yes, it strayed a little bit from its RPG roots, but it was really fun and engaging of a third person shooter. Lots of compelling planets, areas, new characters, old character moments, but the one thing that held Mass Effect 3 back is you probably know what we're gonna say, the ending. The ending was incredibly divisive and kind of went off the rails for a lot of people. And while Mass Effect 3 was a great third game in this trilogy, it didn't quite stick the landing for some. We did everything we could. We built the Crucible, but it didn't work. We fought as a united galaxy, but it wasn't enough. That doesn't totally discount the series or the game by any means, but the different ways the ending could go, none of them really seem to make a lot of people happy. Obviously, some people liked it, and then Bioware also did go and change things and add things, so there's a lot to the whole Mass Effect 3 ending thing that we don't feel like revisiting at this point, but I think it's worth pointing out just how good Mass Effect is and how good Mass Effect 3 is otherwise that that bad ending thing didn't completely derail the trilogy. It kind of almost feels like it fared better than the Game of Thrones HBO TV series where people absolutely loved it and then and they totally ruined the last season and the last episode, and that really tarnished everybody's feelings on the whole thing. Mass Effect somehow managed to survive the ending controversies. Granted, we had Mass Effect Andromeda, which not a lot of people loved, but still to this day, people have a soft spot in their hearts for Mass Effect, and that's still ultimately good. This game came real close to being perfect. Next over at number six, we have Cyberpunk 2077. When this game released in 2020, it was an absolute mess for a lot of players. You've probably heard about it by now. Chances are if you watch gaming videos, somebody told you about it. Cyberpunk 2077 had graphical issues, real technical problems with the gameplay, poor AI. This thing was an absolute mess and it shouldn't have really been released in the state it was. This damaged the reputation of the game and developer CD Projekt Red, who had been beloved at this point for The Witcher 3, an incredible game. Now in 2023, Cyberpunk 2077 is great. They cleaned it up, they added more to the game, they put their money where their mouth is and fixed the damn thing. And it really is a great experience, but that launch really harmed things. Some people never wanna go back to this game. Some people are still pissed at the developers. A lot of people got a refund and never looked back and some people stuck with it and checked it out and now it is much better and that's a shame. The technical stuff, the stuff keeping Cyberpunk from being a true masterpiece is a shame because underneath it all, there's a really cool story there and a really cool city. That city is absolutely worth exploring and the story and characters worth getting whisked away with. It's just a shame it had that rough launch truly holding it back from greatness, but we've talked about this game to death at this point, you get it. Next over at number five, oh, this one might piss some people off, but Grand Theft Auto V does not have a perfect single player campaign. We're gonna come out and say it. Granted, every Grand Theft Auto adventure has its share of a couple of missions that suck or are frustrating, but Grand Theft Auto V just has a lot of weird, monotonous moments that we dread playing through when it comes to a replay. The 2013 game is great, 
People still love it. People still play it to this day for various reasons and replay the campaign. But for us, it's the one we revisit the least just because of how much mundane and weird stuff is in the game. Like when you have to do yoga, the mission where you have to move the crates with a crane, the missions where you have to pick up cars with a tow truck. Now, in through the bloated nose and out through those wrinkled lips. The game forces you to do some boring crap, and I know it's part of the story and there's a lot of dialogue and funny moments in it, but playing through that stuff is not very fun. Being a dock shipping worker is not something I want to do in a Grand Theft Auto game. If I wanted to do that, I would just pick up like dock worker shipping simulator on Steam, which is probably a game at this point. Those dull, boring missions get in the way of what is otherwise a great campaign with zany characters, really cool moments, and fun missions like the heists and stuff. There's a lot there. The only other mark we'll say on Grand Theft Auto V is the fact that they never put out any like single player story expansion or DLC or anything like that. We really would have loved to have seen the adventure continue in single player with some cool content like GTA 4 had, but hey, still a cool game regardless. Now, next over at number four, let's talk Dark Souls. Okay, relax. Listen, Dark Souls is absolutely great, but the one complaint everybody had about Dark Souls was Blight Town. Blight Town was the one thing that really held it back from greatness, specifically in the early days when the game released because when you went here, it was like 10 frames per second. At this point, it's like a meme. It's like a legend at this point with Souls players and with gamers. Blight Town was just like a crappy garbage area that fell apart at the seams. It was even more frustrating because like of the Dark Souls areas, it's just a really annoying one to play through, frame rate or not. The poison, the enemies, the narrow ledges you had to walk, all this stuff in the various parts of Blight Town were a pain in the ass. And then couple that with a weird choppy low frame rate, it made it that much worse. If you're a Souls player, and at this point, if you've played them all, you've been through a lot, Blight Town is probably not that big of a deal to you, but back in the day, it was the one thing holding back Dark Souls from being perfect. Down to number three, if we're talking about games that are near perfect, we have to mention The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time and the Water Temple. The Water Temple is the one thing in the game that people hate. Specifically, I think, because the rest of the temples in the game are absolutely awesome. They are perfectly paced, satisfying to complete, and the Water Temple for a lot of people just kind of drags that all down. It's one of the more difficult and more arduous of the temples with some puzzles that just feel like it's a lot of backtracking and it's annoying. And there's one key that is just such a pain in the ass to find. It's a lot of monotonous backtracking here and there. And then the fact that it's just kind of slow to move around makes it that much more painful. traversing water is just tedious and annoying. People often just don't like swamps and water areas or levels or gimmicks in games. And the water temple here is pretty much the prime example of that. Now down to number two, sorry guys, we're sticking with Zelda. Let's talk Breath of the Wild. For most people, this game is a no brainer. A lot of people absolutely love it. If you don't, you got valid reasons. It's a very different Zelda game. But for the people that love it, they still have one complaint, typically, and that's the weapon degradation. The weapon degradation in this game, for many, is considered to be an absolute pain in the ass, a needless addition of frustration that otherwise holds you back from a lot of fun and cool combat scenarios. Constantly swapping weapons, never really having a perfect awesome one because it's just gonna break in five seconds. <laughs> makes for a pain in the ass for a lot of the game. There are valid reasons and some scholarly insight as to why weapon degradation is actually a clever video game mechanic, but it can be interesting or mechanically complex, but at the end of the day, if it gets in the way of the fun and some people are just frustrated by it, uh, then the complaints are valid in our opinion. So if you like Breath of the Wild, like we certainly did, your one complaint might tend to be the weapon degradation. Some people can get over it, sure, but you gotta admit, sometimes it's kind of a pain in the ass, and it's a pain in the ass in a game that is otherwise perfect. 
Now down to number one, we have Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain. Now you probably know what we're gonna say about this one if you've played it, but hey, let's talk. Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain is a pretty much perfect stealth game. It really takes great stealth and sneaking game mechanics and it applies it to an open world formula perfectly. It does not feel forced as an open world game. They didn't just take the Metal Gear Solid formula and plop it into another generic open world game. No, they made stealth dynamic and complex and give the player a ton of choice and freedom as to how they tackle objectives in semi-open worlds. It's really, really fun to play and so satisfying from the main character's movement to the amount of pools you have at your disposal to different times of day, the behavior of the artificial intelligence, the enemies. Bodies out in the open. Find some place to drop them out of sight. There's a lot here, and it makes for an incredible stealth experience. Top tier. I mean, the Metal Gear games are considered the grandfather of stealth video games for a reason. The only problem is, the other thing about Metal Gear Solid games that is great is the story. Metal Gear Solid games from the original Metal Gear Solid in 1998 are brimming with cutscenes, compelling characters, great writing and story, and Metal Gear Solid 5, unfortunately, drops a ball with that. There's just not enough story here. There's a lot of argument to be made about whether or not the story is technically finished, and there are some compelling arguments on both sides, but that aside, even with the story that's in here, there's just not enough of it. And we wanted more. We wanted to hear more from Big Boss. We wanted to hear more about this time period, specifically in the lore, in the canon of Metal Gear Solid. And unfortunately, there's not enough, and we're just left with a ton of questions still to this day. Granted, there's a lot more to talk about this one behind the scenes if you want to get in depth with the Metal Gear Solid nerd stuff, but still, at the end of the day, there are just characters that we wanted to hear more from, a bad guy we wanted to know more about, and we didn't quite get a ton of resolution. Metal Gear Solid games often have perfect story and gameplay, and this one falls a little bit short on the perfect story standpoint, but still, it is absolutely great, but I'm biased because I just love Metal Gear Solid. But hey, speaking of that, this was an incredibly opinionated list of games that are almost perfect, but not quite for very specific reasons. Like I said, this is just nitpicking for the sake of it. We do love a lot of these games, but we wanna hear your picks down in the comments because this can make for a really fun series that is going to annoy a lot of people. But I digress. Let us know what you think in the comments. And if you like this video and you like talking games with us every day, all you got to do is click the like button because it does help us out. But as always, thanks for watching and we'll see you guys next time.